The goal of this video is to give an intuitive understanding of what sun-synchronous orbits are and why they are useful. We'll be going over how the sun-synchronous orbit is defined, the J2 perturbation, the Keplerian orbital elements of a sun-synchronous orbit, and the associated ground tracks. So the 34th video in the series, and this one I'm going to be going over sun-synchronous orbits. So we start with a definition where the sun-synchronous orbit is defined as a near polar orbit where the nodal precession rate is matched with Earth's mean orbital rate around the sun. So we're going to break down the definition where the first part is a near polar orbit where a polar orbit has an inclination of 90 degrees and goes directly over the north and south poles of the Earth. It's near polar, and the sun-synchronous orbits are slightly retrograde, which means their inclinations are slightly greater than 90 degrees. The nodal precession rate is the rate of change with respect to time of the right ascension, which is a Keplerian orbital element, and we're doing a quick review in the next slide of what that is. And the Earth's mean orbital rate around the sun is just the mean rate at which the Earth goes around the sun. So the Earth goes around the sun in roughly 365.25 days. So the true anomaly of the Earth will change by 360 degrees, which is one revolution every year. So you have a sun-synchronous orbit when the rate of change of the right ascension due to the J2 perturbation is equal to the rate of change of the true anomaly of the Earth. So this means that the angle between the vector from the sun to the Earth and the vector normal to the orbital plane remains constant at all times. And I have that kind of sketched out in this diagram where we have at time equals zero, we have this orange orbital plane where the sun is in that direction. And in this particular case, I have the vector normal to that plane kind of in the same direction as the sun vector with respect to the earth. So then at some time equals one, this plane has rotated due to the perturbation of J2, but also the sun has moved with respect to the earth because the sun is going around the sun. So th these angles are still equal and the same thing with the sun at time equals two, some arbitrary time. So a real quick review on right ascension and the J2 perturbation, just from some of my previous videos, I'll have links in the description. But basically the right ascension is defined at this angle between this reference direction, which is the first point of Aries in the Earth center inertial frame. So this vector, which is X vector in the Earth center inertial frame, that angle to the ascending node, where the ascending node is defined as where the orbital plane crosses up through the plane of reference, which in the Earth's center equatorial frame is the equatorial plane of the Earth. And again, I go deeper into detail in this video, so you can go ahead and check that out if you need a refresher. And then for the J2 perturbation is the perturbation due to the fact that the Earth is the Earth is an oblate spheroid, so which means that because the Earth is rotating, the, equ the equatorial radius is larger than the polar radius, which means it's not a sphere, which means that the center of gravity is not at the geometric center of the Earth, which causes a perturbation. And again, I go deeper into that in that video. And then also want to go over this paper from JPL because this is where I get a lot of the information of this video. Uh, this is really a great paper from some guy named Ronald at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory given the ABCs of a sun-synchronous orbit mission design. Um, I'll put, have a link in the description because this is a really good paper that goes deeper into the math and more details than I will in this video, but I definitely use this paper because it's really good and I'm going to go over some of the stuff that he did in this paper. Which one of the first things, or one of the most important things that he does in this paper is describe the perturbations due to a non-spherical Earth, which is J2. Deeper in the paper, he goes into J3 as well, but I'm just going to be focusing on J2. So he gives the, the time derivative of the right ascension of an orbit with respect to um, the P, which is the orbit parameter, which is a function of the semi-major axis and eccentricity, and I, which is the orbital inclination. So this equation right here describes how that right ascension is changing with respect to time. And we're going to be using this equation to kind of create this function that he has here. Again, he goes into a lot more detail, but this is the graph that we're going for. So given some altitude, which is H in this paper, and assuming an eccentricity of zero, because a lot of the times the eccentricities are close to zero, when you're actually going to fly a spacecraft, you can get whatever inclination that you need in order to have a sun synchronous orbit. So I'm going to be using kind of these numbers, creating my own plot, just using his equations in order to go over how you design these sun synchronous orbits. So again, I wanted to give this uh, sun synchronous orbits another view from an, from a sun point of view. So this blue line here represents the orbital plane. And again, I have the example with a vector normal to the orbital plane is in the same direction 
as the vector pointing from the sun to the earth. So I just wanna give another view where you can see from the sun-centered how this orbital plane is rotating as it goes around with that vector. So the angle between the position vector of the earth and the orbital plane is always equal. I just wanted to show that in the inertial frame. So as far as how to choose orbital parameters, that equation I showed from that paper, the first thing you wanna to do to create that plot where you have on the x-axis your altitude and on your y-axis your inclination, the first thing you wanna do is solve for inclination in that equation, which is given by this equation, i equals the inverse cosine, negative two omega dot spacecraft, this is supposed to be a dot here, 3j2, the radius of the earth over p squared times n. When you substitute the orbit parameter in mean motion, uh, where we assume that E equals zero because we, we're assuming a circular orbit for this analysis, we say that P equals A because one minus zero equals one, and then one times A equals A. And then the mean motion is defined as the square root of mu over the semi-major axis cubed. And the semi-major axis is just equal to the Earth radius plus the altitude uh, for a circular orbit. So then plugging all those in, assuming a circular orbit, you get this equation, which is the inclination is equal to the inverse cosine, negative two, omega dot, this is supposed to be the rate of change of the spacecraft, three times j2, radius of the Earth, semi major axis squared, and then square root of mu over a cubed. So this is the equation we're gonna be using for this plot that we have here. It looks linear, but it's not actually linear, it's the inverse cosine. So we have in this plot in the x-axis the altitude. This is the exact same plot that he had in his paper, just remade it in Python. And we have the inclination. And for the ground tracks that I'm gonna show next, this is just kind of the values that I'm using. I just picked three values, 400 kilometers altitude with an inclination of 97 degrees. And this value can also be thought of negative 83 degrees if you wanted to find the inclination from negative 90 to 90. I'll make another video going deeper into inclination. But it's basically the same thing as saying negative 83 degrees, where the, large, where the highest latitude you're going to reach in a 97 degree inclination is 83 degrees, and it's going retrograde. And again, I'll go deeper into a future video. But then just three data points here, 99 and 101, so you can see how the relationship of the altitude with the inclination for a sun-synchronous orbit. So first, I just plotted out six orbital periods of each one of these, where the white one is a 400 kilometer orbit, the orange one is 1,000, and the blue is 1400 and you can just see so one of the reasons that these sun synchronous orbits are used because you get total coverage of the earth besides just a few degrees off the poles which for most of the time aren't really observed anyway so this is just six orbits and if you're in a 400 kilometer orbit you're going to go around the earth roughly 15 times so you're going to be able to see basically all longitudes of the earth with this type of orbit that's why polar orbits are really good for Earth observation type of applications. And then I just need to get a zoomed in example because Europe is getting quite crowded, uh, as you can see in this plot. Um, but again, as I said in the previous videos, let me know uh, what city you're watching from and I can go ahead and add it to the plots. And then these are the Keplerian orbital elements for a one year propagation, and these are the delta values. So basically the change in the Keplerian orbital elements over this year. So we're going to go through each one at a time, with the first one being the right ascension over time, which when we set up the orbital elements the way we do, we actually match what we're expecting, where if we propagate this orbit for 365 days, we should expect to see a change in the right ascension of 360 degrees, which does match up with this with a little bit of numerical error. And I'll go deeper into that when I talked about the center major axis. But next, we'll, I want to talk about the true anomaly and the argument of perigee. Because we assumed a circular orbit in this, the argument of perigee is actually arbitrarily defined because the argument, argument of perigee points from the center of the orbit to the periapse, where there technically is no periapse in a circular orbit because there is no point that is closer than any other point in a true circular orbit. Obviously, in real life, this changes, but that's why it kind of moves around so much because it's arbitrary. And again, the true anomaly is defined as the angle between that vector pointing to periapse and where the spacecraft is at any given time, which is why it has such a weird plot here. The eccentricity and inclination just oscillate, which is pretty expected. And the one thing to note here is the center major axis is actually secularly decreasing over time, which is not actually true because 
this analysis is being done using numerical solvers, which actually don't all the time conserve energy. And this is an example of not conserving energy because we know that gravity is a conservative force. So energy should be conserved, but that's not the case here. And this is one thing I kind of, I think it's interesting that is worth mentioning that I'm going to go deeper into another series that I'm doing, but energy drift and computer simulations where the energy is not actually conserved. I think this is really interesting. And again, I have a numerical method series that I'm working on. And I'm going to go deeper into that because it's very interesting. So, oh, actually, I'm going to sh before this, I'm going to just show the Python real quick of how I did all this. So first, for the ground tracks, we have certain inclination. Oh, before that, we need to go to. So this is the plot real quick I did of the inclination versus the altitude over time. So where I have this function where you calculate the inclination as a function of altitude, where I just basically plug in those numbers that I had in that slide and then just do the plotting real basic and I just I was doing some printing in order to make that table but then it's pretty straightforward how to make that plot this is just the most important thing is just getting this equation and then these numbers for mu j2 earth radius and the rate of change of the right ascension which is going to be equal to the radian value of the earth going around the sun in 365.24 days and then I get those ground track orbits from plugging in just these three values that I had in the table and then just going through orbit propagator, making sure I turned on the perturbations. Uh, same thing with kind of plotting the Keplerian orbit elements, make sure that J2 perturbation is turned on. Calculate the lat long and then just plot the lat long and I also had a 3D plot, but it didn't really show much. I didn't think it was worth showing uh, for that, but then that's how the ground tracks get made. So again, that's it for this video. Uh, one of the things that I kind of want to mention is that I I'm thinking of kind of changing a little bit of what I'm going to make the videos in the future. So I feel like I've gotten pretty deep in the orbital mechanics video side of things. I'm, this is the 35th video. So I kind of want to pivot over to a bit of rocket trajectories, spacecraft attitude control, and numerical methods. Because these are also very interesting topics in astrodynamics, where astrodynamics is an extremely diverse field. Um, so I kind of just want to pivot because I feel like I've gone deep into orbital mechanics, but there's so much more to cover and that I want to do because all these things are really interesting. But again, I still have over 30 videos of ideas on orbital mechanics. So I am very open to suggestions and requests. If you guys want to see anything specifically in orbital mechanics, just let me know. I mean, these videos are in no particular order. I just want to get all this out there at some point as I've been doing. So yeah, um, that's it for the video. Uh, hit like and subscribe if you liked the video to help me out with the YouTube algorithm. And again, just leave any suggestions or requests or any comments that you have. And thank you for watching.